So today I'll present a simple procedure for deriving convergence rates of these methods and the procedure generalizes to a wide class of algorithms and uh, I'll talk about those other al algorithms at the end. But the outline for today is just a brief overview of some algorithms from first order splitting methods. Our main question that we uh, motivated all of this and the challenges and techniques. So what is a splitting? For us today it's just a decomposition of an optimization objective into two possibly simpler functions. So the setting we're working in today is a Hilbert space. We're assuming functions are closed and convex, but not necessarily differentiable. I'll go ahead and tell you exactly when we assume that they're differentiable. So there's one operator that really features in, in splitting op, um, methods. This is the proximal operator. It's the main subproblem used in all of these methods. And it takes a point in a Hilbert space and outputs another point in a Hilbert space, and you apply it repeatedly to generate a sequence of points that converge to a minimizer. You'll notice that the proximal operator is defined by a variational problem. So if you applied this to f plus g directly, it would be almost as difficult as minimizing the sum. But what we're going to use today is this simple uh, characterization of the uh, minimizer of this sum as an implicit subgradient step. You'll notice that this is a subgradient taken at the target point, prox gamma x. And we're going to use this throughout the talk. So why is this operator so important and useful? Well, for me, it's useful and important because many functions in machine learning have simple or closed form proximal operators. So the most common one is the L1 norm, which has a component-wise soft thresholding form. And this is why algorithms in, say, compressive sensing are so fast today. OK, so I'm presenting the algorithms in a sort, sort of non-standard way. I just want to um, basically show the commonalities between all of these algorithms. So the first two things that are in common with all these algorithms is that they're generating a sequence of points that hopefully converges to a minimizer. The second thing is that they're all taking steps along the negative subgradient direction of some functions. So what's different about these algorithms? So the subgradient method is a completely explicit method. It takes a subgradient at the start point, zk. The proximal point algorithm is completely implicit. It takes a subgradient at the target point, zk plus 1. The forward backward splitting algorithm is a mixture of the two. It first takes an explicit step followed by an implicit step. And the douglas ratchford splitting algorithm is also of a similar form, but it's a mixture of points. These xf and xg are sort of mysterious points that arrive in the analysis. So why do I show these forms today? Because I want to make two points. Basically, that this successive iterate difference controls the size of the subgradients. And the second point I want to make is that this leads to a natural way of viewing the algorithms in terms of diagrams. So if we look at the subgradient method um, and the proximal point algorithm, they're exactly described by some sort of line. Here again, we take an explicit subgradient at z and move along this direction with some step size gamma. And for the proximal point algorithm, we do the same thing, except we have an explicit point. The forward backward splitting algorithm is similar, except we now have some sort of triangle formation. Um, we move an explicit step, so just a forward gradient step, and a backward or implicit proximal step. So this, is, this looks nice, but it's not very useful yet. So Let's describe the douglas ratchford splitting algorithm in terms of a diagram. So start off with this point z. You move to the proximal operator and keep going in the same direction. You get to a reflection point. You do the same thing with respect to f. You get some point over here, and you average the input and output. From this diagram, you can immediately see what the subgradients are. They're exactly generated by the proximal operator here and the proximal operator <laughs> here. You also get a couple symmetries. The first symmetry is that, uh, the identity I show here at the bottom right that if you follow the length of the triangle, the perimeter here, you'll exactly get this identity because you get two of these g subgradients, one of the f subgradients, and then you add another one back. The other symmetry comes from the midpoint <coughs> line here. You'll see that these two points, xf and xg, if you subtract uh, xg from xf, you get exactly z plus minus z. So you get a few symmetries here. And this is kind of nice because it tells us, for instance, uh, if you have a fixed point of the algorithm, z plus, then this length is zero, this base, this is zero, the subgradient sum is zero, and the x, f, and x, g are the same, so you get an optimal point. OK, so I'll just talk about my main question now. So how fast and how slow are splitting algorithms? So we're only going to consider one measure of convergence today. There's um, other measures in the paper. We're going to talk about objective error. So first, we have to fix a minimizer x. And then we choose a sequence of points that hopefully converges to a minimizer. The objective error is this term here, this gap. And what we want to know is how, many, how big and how small is this gap after k iterations. So there's other measures in the paper, and we won't talk about those today. 
So our results is presented along this line. It's hard to present convergence rate results in a, in a very compact way. But um, on the left, you'll see algorithms that are slow. And on the right, you'll see algorithms that are a little bit faster. On the left, you see non-smooth methods. And on the right, you see some sort of smoothness. And in the middle, you'll see Douglas Ratchford splitting in ADMM, which I, I didn't talk about ADMM today, but I think most people are familiar with that. So these results are kind of counterintuitive to me. Here, I'm not assuming any smoothness information. And the Douglas Ratchford splitting algorithm converges just slightly faster than the subgradient method, or forward backward splitting without any smoothness. And it's counterintuitive to me because these methods perform very well in practice. And the other counterintuitive part for me is that if you just average the iterates generated by this algorithm, you immediately improve the convergence rate to big O of 1 over K. And this is almost as fast as the proximal point algorithm, which has this little O of 1 over K rate. And remember, this proximal point algorithm had to evaluate a variational problem at each iteration that was almost as difficult as minimizing f plus g directly. Instead, the douglas ratchford splitting algorithm splits these two problems and, give, and uses two different proximal operators independently instead of evaluating one of the sum. So we also have smooth rates over here. If you add any smoothness to douglas ratchford splitting, then you end up increasing the rate from, for the same sequence here to this little o of 1 over k. And the nice thing about this is that Forward-backward splitting generally requires um, a bound on the Lipschitz constant of the gradient. douglas ratchford splitting does not need any of that information. You don't have to take a small step. So this is one reason why this might be nice to apply douglas ratchford in the smooth case. So should we always average? Um, my answer to that uh, is no. I mean, the rates always improve, right? From little O of 1 over square root of k plus 1 to big O of 1 over k plus 1. But in applications like machine learning, you might have um, the objectives typically have a solution that has a certain structure that you want to preserve, like sparsity or low rank. Here I'm trying to solve this problem AX equal to B, subject to finding a sparse solution. And you look at the sparsity of the algorithm as, project, uh, as it um, progresses. The sparsity of the non-ergodic iterate drops off at about um, 10 cubed, so it's pretty sparse. Um, and this is the number of non-zero entries on the right. And then the ergodic iterate is still averaging in bad information for non-sparse iterates. So it's not always a good idea to average, but it does improve the rate. So what are the challenges? In splitting algorithms, there's no sort of natural point to evaluate at all times. The canonical example of this would probably be if you uh, sum a characteristic function f for some set and another function g, the only natural point to evaluate the objective at is inside the set c, otherwise you get an infinite value. So usually you should make some sort of Lipschitz assumption on the functions. The other challenge is that the objective does not decrease monotonically. So classical approaches generally don't work um, the same way. And see, you hear, see, this is the exact same problem of the basis pursuit. And this is the non-ergodic, or the last iterate over all times. It's very oscillatory. And the ergodic iterate actually achieves a worst case rate here. And this is pretty common. Okay. So we don't have a monotonic objective, but we have other quantities that are monotonic. And the quantity that we're looking at here is the distance to the fixed point of the algorithm. So in general, these algorithms have um, a fixed point that they're looking for. And at each step, we get a little bit closer to the fixed point by amount that depends on the successive iterate difference. We also have a monotonicity property for the successive iterate difference. So if you rearrange the first inequality and sum, you'll see that this successive iterate difference is monotonic and summable. And this is almost always true. Now recall what this zk plus 1 minus ek was. It was exactly a subgradient of the function. So this leads us to our techniques. We have this old lemma that if you, sum, if you have a summable and monotonic sequence, you converge with rate little o of 1 over k. This is from a book by Knopf on sequences and series in the 50s. And then if you look at what happens and just apply this to the successive iterate difference, you automatically get a convergence rate of little o of 1 over square root of k. Then we see what, exactly what happens. The subgradients have a nice. Uh, convergence rate here, and the xf minus xg are equal, say in douglas ratchford splitting. Now what we do is we derive an inequality that bounds the objective error at the current iteration using this term or a subgradient term, and that immediately applies a non-ergodic rate. The ergodic rate is similar, except you don't need any of this stuff. All you have to do is sum this inequality and use Jensen's inequality. It's fairly sim simple. So to sum up, we don't have monotonic quantities, so we search for monotonic quantities. And then we use these monotonic quantities to bound the objective at that term. And this is how you would prove convergence rate of a splitting method. 
So the conclusion is that in the paper we analyzed a lot, uh, many more methods, um, including ADMM. Um, all the rates are sharp. So this is a new result. And in fact, all the little O results weren't known before. There's a lot of applications in the paper toward the end. So there's new convergence rates for feasibility problems, distributed model fitting, uh, linear programming, semi-dependent programming, and decentralized ADMM. And in a follow-up paper, we showed that douglas ratchford splitting and ADMM automatically improve when F and G have some sort of regularity property. So we already saw this for differentiable F and G, that the little o of square root of uh, 1 over square root of k plus 1 gets faster and goes to a, big, a little o of 1 over k plus 1. And we, in the end, we actually generalize these to a large class of primal dual algorithms. So to sum up, um, basically, we have here, we noticed a common pattern in splitting algorithms, and we um, notice that it generalized to a lot of methods, and we applied them there. And so if you're interested in applying these sort of techniques, just take a look at the paper, um, and I'll put some references up at the end.